question, ladies, is, Keza, you, we can go to the next question. So the next question is, what two, three words come to mind when you think about monitoring and evaluation? Thank you all for filling in the registration doc. We saw that all of you, most of you have been involved in some way or the other in M&E, which is great in your countries. And uh, we now want to know what words come to mind when you think of M&E. If you're just joining us now, please click on the link that is in the chat bar. The link is, has been shared by Keza and it says www.mentimeter.com. And once you get there immediately, you have access to a link, um, a, a, a word, a document, and you type in the three words. Thank you so much for sharing those words. I can see we have 18 people who have submitted. We have 65 people on the chat. I'm hoping to see more responses, 21 now. And uh, Loveness, we can definitely reshare the link. Keza, uh, Rita, can somebody reshare the link? Thank you. Just, yes. Um, I think some people who come on later cannot see the links that have been shared before. So, yes. Okay, it's been shared again. Thank you, Rita. Hazel, you can get the link. Barbara Oketa, I saw you posted some messages in the chat bar. Please click, click that link. And the question that we're answering is what three, or, you know, two, three words come to mind when you think about M and E. And we have 30 people now who've uh, posted. And some of the words, you know, data definitely stands out. Impact, progress, okay, performance. I'm looking at some of the smaller ones, change. That's true. You know, with M and E, we're able to track change. And as you know, there's no right or wrong answer. It's what comes to mind for you. Thank you so much for sharing. So we're going to quickly go to our third question. Our third question is on a scale of one to five, five being the highest and one being the lowest. How familiar are you with monitoring and evaluation? How familiar are you with monitoring and evaluation? So the click, uh, you just have to click the link that is in the chat function. I can see already 10 people have clicked that link. Thank you. Thank you for clicking it. You know, I can see some twos, very high twos, five. Wow, great. A lot of people are in the middle, 10, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clicking. I see 35 people. I hope we get the most, you know, uh, clicks for this. So if you're just joining us, the link is right in the chat function, www.mentimeter.com. Once you click it, you're able to participate by um, scaling, you know, clicking on the scale and indicating your level of comfort. So we have 41, because I'm just going to push a little, hoping to get to 50. So if you have not yet clicked, click the link, mentimeter.com, and you should be able to give us your range. Okay, great. Thank you so much, ladies. So we have 12 people who are sort of saying, I'm in the middle. We have 10 people who are saying, yeah, I'm a four, definitely. We have seven people on this call who, yeah, just call me on anything about M and E. I'll be able to answer it in the dead of the night. It's good to have you on. I am Diana again. I'm calling. I'm dialing in personally from Kampala, Uganda. It's so great that you've been able to participate in these few questions. We're going to be using the Mentimeter again. Please do not close the browser. But what is important is that all of us here are joined by one common goal, really to empower girls, to empower women across the world to take action, to own their story, to take up their leadership journey and to change their world. So it is with great pleasure, you know, with great pleasure that I introduce to you the women who have been behind the scenes, working this, bringing this together. And before I do that, just allow me to share with you our agenda, our agenda today. We hope to finish, you know, one hour, 30 minutes, and we run a tight ship, I promised you. 
you can confirm that appointment, but uh, we beg your indulgence in case we spill over by a few minutes. It's going to be an exciting afternoon and I'm sure you will agree, right? So we're starting with, um, we're starting with introductions, which I will do shortly. And then we will invite um, Izana Saleh, who is the leader, uh, global president for G4G. She will speak after. And then we will go into a discussion around how does M&E fit into the big picture of G4G. We will then cover the tools that we are using. And how do I know that we are using them? In the registration form, the question was posed, how many of you are engaged or involved in M&E in your country? And there were some options placed, filling in mentee forms, filling in mentor forms. A lot of you said, I'm involved in that. A lot, some of you said you're involved in evaluation. And as we go along, we'll see how all this come together. And then we shall have specific breakout rooms. Some of you were able to register and indicate the breakout room you wanted to be a part of. In case you did not, do not fear, you will be placed in the room of your choice. So what you just need to do, just take a picture of this screen so that when it comes to being placed in a specific breakout room, you're able to click and join the room that you wish to join. And Keza will be handling our breakout rooms, Keza and Rizana. Okay, so allow me to do the introductions of these amazing ladies. These ladies have been working tirelessly to make sure that we get you as excited as we are about monitoring and evaluation for G4G. So the lady right here is Joan. She's from Uganda. We have Rita from South Africa. We have Mary from Kenya. We have Maria from Zambia. We have Laura from Kenya. We have Judith, Judy, as we call her, from Kenya. We have Kini from South Africa, and I'm sure you can ref you can uh, recognize me even with the hair, right? So yes, this is me. And then we have Crispin. Crispin is from Zimbabwe. So this group, you know, covers multiple, you know, countries across the African continent. And of course, we also have the global team, the secretariat team that supports us. But back to the introductions, we have Keza. Keza is from South Africa. She's been the person, the brain behind the Mentimeter. And we thank you, Keza. And then we have um, Ch Chidze. She's from Zambia. And we have R uh, Rizana, Rizana, who's been amazing, amazing in managing our marketing, putting together a lot of docu, a lot of the pack that you see us sharing this afternoon. And we have Rifka, Rifka, an amazing, amazing person who's going to be supporting with the breakout rooms and in the rooms as well. So thank you very much for coming on. This is the group, but there's somebody who really at the back of it all supports G4G across countries and across the different strategic arms of G4G. And she's called Izana Saleh. Izana, you're very welcome. I'm sure you have access to share. So I'm going to stop sharing and sure. hand over to you to share with us, what is G4G 2.0? What does it sure. mean? Thank you. Thank so you much. so much, Diana. Firstly, I want to applaud you for that energy that you have. Um, I wrote in the chat group, I wrote in, the, in our um, Zoom chat group, I love your energy. Every time we do a Zoom calls, I'm in Malaysia, you're in Uganda, but I can feel your passion all the way here. So kudos to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to you and your team, Rita, and all the wonderful ladies. You've just mentioned all their names. I am observing all the work being done um, on for, through the WhatsApp chat. So I applaud you for the tenacity, the detail-oriented mindset that each of you have to be able to bring today to life. This one and a half hour session doesn't come about just like that. You have prepared so much, so much even before our G4G 2.0 session. So for that, I really, I really do thank you. I'm about to uh, share a screen right now. So I will need you to tell me if you're able to see this. Diana, are you able to see? Yes, this? yes, I can see okay. it. 
Okay, great. So first and foremost, uh, I have extended my thanks to the team, uh, subcommittee five, as we like to call them. Uh, Rita, Diana, really my heart goes out to you. But I also wanna thank each and every one of you. The last time I was not in share screen, there was maybe 70, 80 people um, who have logged online. Um, so I wanna wish you a very good evening from Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It's about 9.15 PM here. Uh, and good afternoon and good morning to wherever you guys are, you ladies are. Um, I want to say that uh, today in the global chat, where all the global leaders are, we've had many activities that have taken place, whether it's in Brunei, whether it's in uh, Portugal, Kuwait, Botswana. Uh, we've seen so much. Uh, and, and we, the co-founders, so Diana, if I may correct you, um, whilst I am passion, I bleed G for G. I definitely am not alone in finding this. I know Alan, my sister. Alan, if you are there, unmute yourself and say hello. Um, hey, hey, uh, how are hey. you doing, everyone? Hey, all the way from Uganda. <laughs> uh, also, someone else's energy I love. But, you know, there's so many co-founders who started this. Um, and there's so many more leaders like yourselves in here who have brought G4G to where it is today. So I just want to say that this is not an Izana platform or Izana and Allen platform, but it's all of us. Having said that, um, Rita and team has asked me to come on board. I know you've got a timekeeper, Joan, is it? Who's going to sort of shut me off after 10 minutes. Um, so I'll make this uh, quick and snappy. For those of you who don't know the co-founders, how we started, I'm going to share a two minute story. The ladies that you see before you uh, in the G4G uh, t-shirt, we are the co-founders. We were a group of friends. Uh, we are a group of friends. We were classmates at Harvard Kennedy School. And the lady in the red jacket, our dean, Karen Weaver, she's looking at diversity and inclusion. So when we set this up, it really was just a coffee conversation in between classes where we asked each other, hey girls, what are some of the issues that you have in your country when it comes to women? And across the board, regardless if we were from a developing or a developed country, it was always a case of poor representation and leadership. Not always in politics, because, um, for example, we've got uh, the lady with blonde hair there, Hatla, a co-founder from Iceland. Iceland has very strong representation in politics, but very poor representation in the corporate world, the boards and all that. So we found that actually, whether it was China, India, Malaysia, Uganda, Mexico, Uzbekistan, we all had some women representation issues. And we said, you know what? Let's not blame the government because here we always ask each other. It's not about, uh, if, if it's not you, then who? And if not now, then when? So we got cracking immediately. Uh, Alan can certify this. We sat in the dorms and we were working through, we spoke to our professors and lo and behold, um, four or five years later, we are here today and we are in 23 countries. I don't think this is the latest number because we are growing day by day. I cannot keep up. My, my decks are not as updated as I would wish for it to be because every day we're graduating more women. And for that, I, I thank you. I thank you for putting this together. Now, I'm, I've been asked to talk about G4G 2.0. What is G4G 2.0? So last July, July 2020, um, whilst all our fellow sisters were all sort of down with um, uh, trying to manage the pandemic. And as a G4G team, Alan and I got on the phone, actually, we check in on each other. She is my sister, seriously. And we check in on each other and we say, hey, so what are we going to do with G4G? How do we take it across? So we said, you know what? I think we are way past the startup phase. So for the first many years, for those of you who've, who's been with us since day one, you know it's been very organic, sort of grow, all right, let's welcome you, let me introduce you to my friend, etc. But Alan and I, we got on a call, and then we got, we roped, we roped in other co-founders, Hatla, Caro, Ifoda, we got them on a call and we said, look, what can we do to take G4G to the next phase? Um, we are beyond the startup phase because we are getting leadership, local leadership in various countries who are reaching out to us saying, we want more. Not only did you want more from the co-founders, you also wanted to be able to contribute more. 
And in an organization like ours, it is about each of us and what we can contribute. So as a result of that conversation in July 2020, uh, we set up we set up surveys uh, to all the different countries to understand what you felt went well in G4G and what didn't go so well in G4G and what 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 more would you want? What's your three year goal, five year goal, and ten year goal? And when we put that together, um, I set up the secretariat team. Uh, a few of them are here. I know Arlene is here. Arlene, say hello if you're here. Aida, I know you're here. Say hello if you can hear me. Hello. So the ladies. Great. So for those of you who are leading the different committees, you'd be familiar with Ida and Arlene and also Davina. We set up a structure, what we call an online lab, strategy lab, where we got together, the team, we formed a structure for a period of 12 weeks on how to really be able to reap your thought process as well as develop what was going to happen to G4G moving forward. So as a result, of that 12 week process. Some of them, I swear, they didn't want to speak to me after Christmas. I said, okay, I will leave you alone for about a month because it was intensive. But let me tell you, you what you're looking at right now on the screen is the result of your fellow sisters' hard work. 12 months of debating, discourse, um, you know, rejecting each other's mindset, accepting each other's mindset, and coming to a compromise of where we saw the organization moving towards. So I'll give you a very high, uh, high overview. Um, Diana, how much time do I have left? Three minutes. Oh dear, all right, I'm gonna blaze through this. So what I want our ladies here to understand is what is our true north? We wanna be as structured as possible moving forward, but please do understand that this year, 2021, is putting everything together, putting in our system, putting in uh, our, making it a habit of our regular meetings, global meetings. So as a result, a couple of things you need to know. Number one, what is what true north? What is the north star that we have anchored upon? And that is by the end of the year 2025, we aim to be present uh, running mentorship circles, evaluating global impact. And this is where this conversation comes in, today's conversation, and all other activities in 50 countries having already graduated 1 million mentees through 10,000 mentors at a minimum. I understand this is ambitious, but we are a bunch of extremely capable ladies, if I do say so myself, from what I have seen in the last four or five years. We can do this, and this is what we call aiming for the impossible, really reaching high and seeing where we go here. Of course, our task as leaders in our own right, we will make sure that we reach the goal. Now, the different departments that have developed through the strategy process last year, there are five. We've got the strategy and fundraising global team, uh, what we call subcommittee one. We've got the content development and training team, subcommittee two. We have the outreach partnerships and marketing team, subcommittee three. Communications and global committee building, uh, subcommittee four. And monitoring and evaluation team, subcommittee five. So also in that process, you realize they have come up with what are their specific goals for each subcommittee. So rest assured that you are in good hands and the ladies are meeting often and the secretary team with the global management, we are checking in all the time. Now, what are we checking in on? We, I've just sort of explained this. Let me run through quickly with you. Each committee has a roadmap. So know that your leaders, your, your subcommittee leaders are very focused on developing, on, on delivering what they can for you, for all of us on a quarterly basis. And the secretary team checks in every couple of weeks. So what we do is we check in, okay, for example, at the end of this month, we're due for another check-in to see if the goals of quarter one has been achieved. Although we did do a check-in a couple of weeks ago and we know where everyone is and how we can uh, deliver so that 2021 is a successful year. What I'm trying to show here is that we, we, have, we will be able to achieve all our goals because we're, we've developed quite a nice uh, skeleton for all the different teams. And the goal is between last year and this year, we are putting in structure so that we can meet 
the 1 million mentees through 10,000 mentors by the year 2025. So this is just a very high overview so you know how we came about with G4G 2.0. And I'm happy to report that all your leads for each subcommittee are on the ball with your work. And so with that, I know someone tried to mute me a second ago. I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, and I hand over back to Diana. Thank you for giving me the space to share. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much, Izana. Flowers to you, flowers <laughs> to you. Thank you so much for your leadership. If you're just joining us, you have just missed an amazing uh, presentation by a very humble Izana was very quick to let us know that there's a whole village you know of ladies in whom they, they founded Absolutely. this so as we go as we go into the deep dive ladies i just want you to reflect by looking at this tree you know they all say that nature adds something it adds vitality it adds life and this tree today is a representation of g4g and how does it represent who we are and what we do the roots which you can barely see are the founders Many of us don't know all their names. Today we know Izana and Alan, others are not on the call. One day maybe we will meet them, but without them sitting in that dorm room, this tree would not have sprouted. It would not have you know, put up a stem. The stem is the five strategic arms, and you've heard Izana talk about them, the strategy and fundraising. We have outreach and partnerships. We have M and E, which is subcommittee five, where we are today. We also have the training content development um, arm, and that's the same. It's what's holding up the branches. It's what's ensuring that our true north of one million ladies by 2025 is achieved. So we then have the branches, and the branches are representative of each country here. And if you've just come on again, you missed to share with us where you're calling in from. But of course, we have South Africa, Uganda, Niger, Malaysia, France, you know, amazing, amazing different countries, Botswana, all these are branches holding up, the, holding up the leaves. And the leaves are those 1 million girls, 1 million girls by 2025. Will our tree be strong? And today, subcommittee five, which is part of the STEM, is largely here to tell you about the tools, the system, the process. And there is no one better fitted to do that than our team leader for subcommittee five, Rita Mutlana. Rita is calling in from South Africa. She's passionate about M&E. And &E, and I must tell you, I'm becoming a disciple. So Rita, over to you. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm laughing just as I'm getting ready to start my, even my dog is coming to attend the ME session. So <laughs> it's storming outside and he likes my office. Sorry. Hi everyone. Uh, lovely afternoon. I think to the people within our region, um, good evening to the folks in Malaysia and the Eastern part of the world. And I saw that there is someone who had signed in from Canada. So good morning. Um, so hi to everyone. Uh, um, this session has been a labor of love. Um, when, when Izana talks about taking G4G to the next level, G4G 2.0, um, it, it, it was an honor and a privilege for us to say the one branch that uh, Diana has been talking about is monitoring and evaluation because we know we have big dreams, we have big goals, but how do we know we are on track or off track? How do we know what we need to do to adjust in order to um, come on board? And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to give you a high level overview. Um, and I would like to clarify up front, this is not a training on M&E. There will be a training on M&E in April. This is to introduce you to the high level overview in terms of what the M&E system looks like so that you can get a flavor of it. And then maybe some of you will want to come for the training. Alternatively, you might think there's someone else in my team in my country that should um, come up for the training. Um, so let me get my slides up. So the overview of um, monitoring and evaluation 2.0. Just by um, in, in, in the chat box, what is monitoring to you? I know some people think, actually said that they're experts. What do you understand is, um, is, is, is monitoring? So in the chat box, please share with us very quickly. I know I don't have a lot of time. Let me actually start my timer.
Reflection, yes. Someone says tracking, yes, I agree with you. Yes, checking and aligning, I like that, yes. Checks and balances, fantastic. Okay, so I know I'm talking to people um, who understand what M&E um, is about. So the way I describe monitoring, this is, and this is, for me, it's a passion because um, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's a privilege, like I said, to be able to bring it to G4G, but monitoring, I say to people, it's like putting the finger on the pulse. Uh, sorry, I work in the public health sector. So it's, it's, you know, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, how are you doing? Um, they check your heartbeat. Alternatively, how well is your pulse doing? And that's what monitoring is about. That's why someone is saying, you know, it's about tracking and making sure that things are right. So um, the way we see it, there are a couple of things that one needs to keep at front and center of their minds. When we talk about monitoring, we're talking about using information. And I start with that because a lot of people have the, the mistaken uh, uh, concept that monitoring and evaluation is really about collecting data and pushing it onto someone else. It's about collecting data, but it's also about using that data to make sure that you improve your performance. It is about routine tracking. We collect the information routinely to put the finger on the pulse and make sure that, yes, we are making progress. Even if it's little progress, we are making some progress. So normally in monitoring and, evalu and evaluation, we have targets. So we are always continuously checking how we're doing against targets. Are we behind? Maybe we need to do something to get us faster towards the target. Are we on track? Or are we even going faster? Because if we're going faster, maybe there's a secret that we did not realize. And then it's, it's an ongoing process. So uh, for monitoring and evaluation, some people think that it's about submit the report and you're over and done with. No, it's something that we continuously do because it's part of our cycle. Something else I'd like to point out is that monitoring and evaluation is about all the different activities we do within G4G. It's not only about counting the mentees and making sure they have graduated or checking how many mentors we have. You remember that data that Izana showed earlier on, but it's also about all the other fundamental elements of G4G activities that help us implement our programs. For example, we have some ladies who run fundraising committees in our different countries that help raise money. For example, for those of us running online sessions now that raise data in order for us to give it to the mentees. Um, in others, we have uh, uh, committees or ladies who are running partnerships and networking activities to boost the image of G4G. So for instance, we have the fireside chats in Uganda. We have the book club that has gone international. Those events give us visibility and it's through those internationally visible events that we are then able to recruit mentors. So all of us, all of us contribute towards it. The communications team, the guys on social media are, 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 are huge contributors towards the recruitment of mentees and mentors. So everyone who has a part to play the, the, the pillars of the house that Ivana showed you, it means everyone um, needs to monitor their data. They need to monitor their progress. It's not only about monitoring the mentees and the mentors, but making sure that everyone else who is contributing to that value chain, we know what they're supposed to be doing. We give them targets and they are able to deliver. Okay, so I think that's something I really would hope to take away from here. And that's why we invited people, people who are saying, yeah, my role is just fundraising. My role is just partnership and networking. My role is just social media. No, we need all of you because your efforts should result in certain um, out outputs and we need to be able to monitor it. So all of us are part of it. Now, evaluation. Evaluation is about taking a stop and saying, where are we? What have we succeeded in doing? So it is something that we don't do all the time on a routine basis, unlike monitoring. Typically, this is something we do maybe after a year. At Girls for Girls, what we do is we do a process evaluation, which is typically at least after six months of the girls having uh, graduated from, from, from the G4G cohort, we then stop and say, the girls left, they graduated, they were happy with their certificates. We all felt there was a change, but where are they? So for instance, where are they in their leadership journal, yeah? journey? So it's, it's, it's about you, you stop and then you do a stock take. But when you stop and you do the stock take, what are you, money, what, what are you evaluating for? There are three key areas that we are asking ourselves and, and there are different types of evaluations. At G4G, we have opted to do what is called a process evaluation. I'm not going to get technical, but it's the simplest and probably the most cost-effective that we can do. 
And given the stage of development our G4G journey is at, it's important to ask these three questions. One, is the G4G program relevant? And for me, that was when I came and introduced G4G to South Africa, it's the first question I asked myself. Even before I said to Alan, yes, I'm going to take this on. I asked myself, is this what the young ladies in South Africa need? And I think all of us sitting in Malaysia, sitting in Pakistan, sitting in Uganda, the people who want to start up new, I see Rwanda is on the line as well, the ladies who just started in Botswana. I think one of the things we grapple with is, is it relevant? So there are certain questions we ask in the evaluation set of questions, and you're go we're going to play with a, a couple of them, where we ask what we are providing you, these different modules, the, the, the six different modules that we give, we, we, we present under the G4G um, um, sessions, are they relevant? Do they speak to what you need? The second um, area that we examine when we're doing an evaluation is asking how effective are the modules and the general delivery of the G4G module. So yes, it might be relevant. We might be talking about courageous leadership and it's good for them, but is it effective? When we run those sessions, are we seeing a change in the leadership capacity of the girls? Are we seeing them adopting the frameworks, for example, in negotiations, in ethics? Um, are they applying it? Or was it just a nice get together and we meet, but, but it's really not having an impact on the girls. So that's the second area that we examine under the evaluation. The last area we look at is sustainability. It's not good enough that we see a change in the young ladies whilst they're part of the G4G program. And yet you come back six months later, one year later, and it's almost like there was no intervention after all. So we ask ourselves questions like, what happens after the girls graduate? And that's when you see things like the alumni groups and things coming up. So the evaluation is very important for it to feed back um, into what it is that we are doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis on our cohorts. The two are intertwined, it's yin and yang. Um, as we are monitoring, we're collecting information. Yes, we are saying the girls have come and attended, but we're also trying to look for the change that we're seeing. I think a lot of us who have been mentors, we see, that for instance, there are some girls who walk in and they will never say anything, their heads are down. By session two, you see them begin to look up. By session three, out of communication, their hand is up. We also capture that in our reports under monitoring, right? Because we capture every, well, one of the good practices we shall be encouraging you is that after every session, you're going to be submitting reports where you track the change. So the monitoring is already beginning to show you the change. It feeds into the evaluation because when you come back and say one year later, you will be able to say, we saw these small changes. How did we add on to those changes? So that's how monitoring and evaluation are interwoven. And of course, once you have your results from the evaluation. So for, for example, in South Africa, I think for the 2019 cohort, which was our pilot cohort, we got very clear feedback in terms of you know, which sessions were, 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 were most impactful and why. They told us which speakers spoke to them. They told us what worked for them. They enjoyed the, the role play and things like that. That information from the evaluation now fed back into what we did in, in uh, 2020. So the two are very intertwined. In other words, what am I saying? It's not enough for you to just monitor. There are some cohorts that focus a lot on, let's collect the feedback forms, feedback forms. If you don't come back, and evaluate, you will have lost a golden opportunity for you to say, okay, let's put the monitoring data together with the evaluation data so that we have a stronger program um, in 2021. So the, the, the heart of monitoring and evaluation is about indicators. Um, and an indicator is something that measures certain characteristics um, or variables that come about in the work that we do. I'm trying not to be technical over here. Um, and and it, it, it is a discipline. So there are certain types of indicators. There are the short-term ones, um, input. Um, so for example, um, what we do to recruit the mentees and mentors, um, what we do in order to activate the cohorts and then the graduation of the girls. So those ones are short-term and we typically measure them um, in our report, in, in our, uh, our, our session reports. Then there are the, the higher level indicators, outcome indicators and impact indicators, which is where we're heading for. Those are the ones we do at a later point in time. And if you were listening to me, you will realize that the impact and the outcome indicators therefore come out of the evaluation process, okay? So I'm going to walk you through um, a value chain or a, a, a set of steps which all of us walk through. And if you've ever been wondering, why is m and &E important for me? I'm going to demonstrate to you how it complements what you do. So here goes. The
sorry, Joanne, you're going to have to give me enough time. I think I started late. So the first set of indicators um, are the, the recruitment indicators, bringing the mentees and the mentors um, on board. Um, we track those numbers and you're going to hear Mary, who is going to talk about the baseline data. How is it that we keep track of how many people have joined us, whether it's mentees or mentors? Those are the inputs. It's the starting point of everything that we do. Then once we have mentors on board, we know that we need to prep them up huh? because remember it's one thing to have mentors who are joining, but it's another thing to prepare them to actually run a cohort because it's a rule within G4G. You cannot be a mentor unless you've been trained. So those are your inputs. You have not yet started seeing results. You're basically just starting off. Then you go into the process where now you're running um, the cohorts, they, they are activated. So for some of us, it's cohorts. In other words, it's many circles who come together to form a cohort. Many circles, for example, at the University of Johannesburg, who together form the UJ cohort. But in some countries, I think, for instance, in Kuwait or Portugal, they were sharing yesterday, they have smaller circles, maybe somewhere about um, eight women or 12 women, who it's, it's basically a simpler setup. But regardless, they have to run and they're overseen by the trained mentors. So even then, we are, we are capturing the data have you gone through sessions one and we know that for us to say we have graduated mentees under the g4g program they must have uh, participated in at least in, in um, they must have participated in at least four of the six sessions for g4g so once they have done that now we begin to see the first set of um of results what we call the output results so the the, the mentees now graduate and this is the difference I sometimes say to people when they say, oh, we have X number of mentees, we have 100 mentees. Are we talking about graduated mentees where we know we have had a chance to influence and have impact? Or are we talking about anyone who signed up? Who are we really interested in? We're interested in the ones that have graduated because we know those girls have gone through the program and G4G can now proudly say we are empowering girls to lead. And then we also have a lighter indicator where we now try and convert mentees to become mentors because it's a self-fulfilling process like um, the story that Diana told with the tree. Then we have at a later le level when we are now doing our evaluations, we come back and we start assessing, okay, you graduated, but where are you in your leadership journey? And there are certain factors that we look for. For instance, the confidence, we look for certain skills, maybe negotiation skills, communication skills, are they exhibiting them? Not only reported by the mentees, but also by people who have observed them. So for instance, the mentors. So in our evaluation in, global, in, in uh, G4G, when we are doing evaluations, we don't only talk to the mentees to self-report. We also talk to people who have visibility over the girls. So when you, when if whoever is coming to the process evaluation room, you'll see that the evaluation values both the mentee responses as well as the mentor responses. And finally, it is the, the big impact that we are looking for is the increased presence of women in influential leadership positions. Izana, Allen, and I have had big discussions about what is impact. Um, sorry, what is, what is impactful leadership? Is it just getting people to sit on a board or are we having them in positions where they can actually, um, they can actually influence? Um, Diana, please give me a few more minutes. I'm gonna skip the game with the Mentimeter because I know I'm running behind time, but let me finish the content at least um, for my slides. So the success of the monitoring and evaluation system is, can only be successful if all of us contribute towards it. If it's only Uganda that is reporting and maybe Botswana, it means that it's going to be very difficult for Izana and Allen and the other co-founders sitting at a global level saying, where are we against the targets of 1 million? If only two out of the 24 countries are reporting. So it's important that all of us are able to join. And what we are saying to you is, you let us know how we can support you. And what we have done for you is that we have designed tools for you. We are simple tools, and we're going to be able to share those with you. We have a simple ME plan. We have a simple results framework within which the indicators are there. We have scheduled the targets in percentage format so that you're able to say, okay, this is what it means in my country. We have also structured the way that work is, data is to be collected and reported in a simple manner. 
That's why instead of putting all the reporting burden on m and &E people, we have split it. There are people who report on cohort data, there are people who report on fundraising data, there are people who report on training data, so that the work is spread out. And we are all, we, we're all volunteers here. We're not feeling overburdened. I remember that was one of the first instructions the founders um, gave us. The other thing we're going to do is that now that we have designed an m and &E plan, we have got the tools, we have got the results framework. In other words, G4G knows what it wants to do. We are here and able to help you train your people. So in April, we're going to be running a two-part training session whereby anyone from the countries that wants to become familiar with m and &E will be trained and we will be issuing certificates um, of attendance. So we're hoping that with that, that's the goodwill, the goodwill that's being extended by G4G, that you will then um, feel incentivized um, to, to at least start reporting um, on your country's uh, data using um, the, available, the, the available tools. So this is just an image of the ME plan, the tools, you're going to be introduced to them and those are the indicators, um, the results framework. So um, I, I, I'm gonna to come to a close over here because I've run out of time. Um, but I, I think it, something that you're going to pick out as we go into the rooms is, and even as we are talking about the tools and the data that we get out of it, is the balance between quantitative data and qualitative data. I'm hoping that people um, get over, sometimes people get blocked when they think it's all about numbers. It isn't. It's a, and I, this, I correlate back to the lessons we have under art of communication. When we always talk about the why behind the what. The what are the numbers. A lot of us, we're able to spout the numbers. But the why, why are we having low uh, mentee retention rates? Why are we having low signups and recruitments of mentors? We need to be able to explore that. So when we are reporting, I'm going to be encouraging all the country team leads and anyone who reviews the reports to not just focus on the numbers. There's no point in saying, yes, eight girls graduated, but eight girls out of how many? Eight girls out of 15, eight girls out of eight. You know, what was it? And if it's eight out of 15, what went wrong? We need to be able to dig. So as we report, please remember to have a balance between your quantitative data, the what, and the qualitative data, which is the how or the why are we seeing the results that, um, that we see. Um, so, okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand it back to Diana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita. We must create time for the Mentimeter and those questions when we come back from the breakout rooms, maybe. But uh, ladies, if you're just joining us, thank you for coming on. Those of us, those of you who've been here from the very beginning, thank you for coming on early. And as we go into the next session, I just want you to, you know, as Rita talked about the why, remember that moment when you signed up for G4G in whatever form, some of you I know are mentors, some of you are mentees, some of you are running cohorts, some of you are coordinating cohorts, but just remember why you signed up for G4G. And what we're trying to do is understand how we can capture that why which you, you alone felt and how we can use that information to be able to create more value for you and for the ladies who are trying to reach through G4G. So we're going straight into the input and Mary, I'd like to invite Mary Chiguru. Mary is from Nairobi, Kenya. She's been a cohort leader. She's run a cohort with our organization and she's going to talk to us about the first indicator, the input, receiving data from mentees and mentors. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Diana, for, uh, for inviting me. I'm glad to take us through the baseline and registration survey. Um, following up on Rita, we need some reference point for us to be able to measure whether we are having impact or uh, we are adding value or there is change. And this is where we start with the baseline and registration. So it also helps us in uh, designing a relevant, effective and sustainable interventions so that we're not just uh, doing something out of the ordinary. So usually we have two kinds of registration. We have one for the mentors and we have one for the mentees. Uh, for the mentors, we normally are doing this on a yearly basis. So we are registering the old and prospective mentors for the year. We are ensuring that our database is up to date every year as we start a year. So I'll take us through the registration form to basically see what kind of information do we normally gather uh, as we recruit our mentors. Uh, so I hope everyone can see the form. 
Okay, so usually we are collecting basic data about uh, the basic information about our mentors. So about our mentors, we get to know who they are, their names, we get to know their occupation. And then we are also going to be asking them if a country has different cohorts, you want to know where would this particular mentor want to be, uh, to be a mentor. So you give them that particular option. We want to know whether they have mentored before. We would like to know whether they have participated in the training. As we said, as Rita said, we want to ensure that our mentors have gone through the training. We are interested in, uh, in whether they are, uh, okay, this was, okay, this was like, in attending any other training. So they may be doing several trainings in the, you can do several training as a mentor. We want to know whether they are interested in that training. So as we design our, our, our trainer, our training program, we'd like to know whether they have started, they would like to start their own cohorts. You know, we have provided a list of, of cohorts that are available, but would they like to start their cohorts? As you said, as, a, as Diana said, I started a cohort within my organization. So we also want to know what basically the support they would require beyond the mentoring. So we give them options of the kind of support that is provided. We want to know how they heard about the G4G. We want to know the media platforms that they actively use, because as you noticed during the COVID season, we did a lot of social media. We, want, we also want to know any other clarification that they have. So basically, this is the basic information we gather about the mentors at the very beginning of every mentoring session. Uh, then we normally also have a registration for our mentees. So we want to know about our mentees who are coming on board. We want to know what kind of an intervention should we be able to design? What are their challenges? What are their dreams? What are their goals? That's the basic information you want to gather from them. You also want to know some, uh, some information about when they would like to, to, be, to be joining the meetings. So in the registration form, we gather a lot of information about that. And basically this is what we have been gathering over the time. Besides the basic information about the, 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 the mentee, we want to know their age groups. We want to know whether they have a disability or not. We would like to know where they would like to be mentored. So if you have cohorts and you want your mentees to join, uh, to, uh, to select a specific cohort, then you list them down. But basically sometimes they may not have a choice because you're within a given, you have a group of mentees within a given region. You want to know when in the year, which month they'd like to participate. We have six sessions that run over six months. So you want to know whether they start in January or when they want to start and when they want to end. You would also want to know the time that would be convenient for them. So that as you're designing your, your intervention, then it falls within the time that your mentees will be there. You want 100% uh, uh, participation and you don't want them dropping off because the time you have chosen for them is inconvenient. So you can decide to give them options about when to do that. You want to know, like now we have been doing a lot of uh, online virtual uh, mentoring. You want to know the devices that they have, that they are using. You also want to know if you're going to be providing data for them for some of the groups. You want to know what, what network they are in so that you can be able to decide on a, on, a good, uh, on a good data plan for them so that you can support them throughout. You want to know how they heard about, uh, about us so that we can also get to know when you're doing marketing, which are the appropriate platforms to market ourselves. Um, get to know which social media they actively use so that when you're coordinating and you're communicating, you can be able to know which one is best for your cohort or for your, for your mentees so that they, you have this effective communication. So in the second section of this data collection, we want to know about their dreams. Remember that our desire is to design relevant effective and sustainable interventions. So you really need to know your target group to get to know who they are, what their aspirations are, what their goals are, what, their what the challenges they are facing. So at the baseline, we ensure that we have all these, then we can be able to, des to design effective interventions for them. So we ask ourselves when, so at the beginning of each cohort, you collect this particular information. Uh, we normally use Google Forms, it's, uh, it's good because it has good analytics. So you don't have to go and enter your Excel. You simply like export yeah, your data into that and you can be able to, sh to show your report immediately. So it's important that we all get familiar with this tool. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to, to respond to that. Thank you, Diana. I need to unmute myself. Thank you so much, uh, Mary.
thank you for taking us through that. And as I said, you know, just wear your heart. However you came into G4G, whether you came in as a mentee, whether you came in as a mentor, how are you received? And we're just saying that we can add value to everybody who's coming on board once we're able to gather some particular information. An interesting story about uh, collecting data. In Uganda, we realized that most of our mentors actually go to and do two sessions a year when we collected data on which on the mentors as we ran the as we went through the year we found that most of our mentors on average participate in two cohorts a year and that completely transformed the way we engage because we realized we can do so much more because of the committed members so as kini comes to share with us what happens in the cohort again i invite you stay stay you know wear that hat that you came into g4g with and ask yourself how does this tool apply to me and uh, with respect to some of the questions, Kini, are you okay? Can you share? Yes, I can share. Perfect. So with respect to some of the questions that are in the chat room, yes, you will all have access to the tools. Yes, there will be a more specific training for your team leads, for your cohort leads, as the case may be. And that will be in April. And again, we'll send out invitations. So this is a teaser. This is just a test of that, you know, the great um, tools and the great material that we have to work with. Thank you. Kini, over to you. Okay, firstly, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this launch. I can't believe it's actually happening. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a uh, mentee feedback form and our mental feedback form. Um, not the extraction process, I forgot to remove that. That will be dealt with after Diana. So Rita will be talking about the extraction process. So as Mary started, Mary started with, you get the baseline data of the mentees. Then eventually you extract them, they start going to cohorts or circles. And after each session, you will send a link to a feedback form, which we have in our Google Drive. Uh, which we will share with all the cohorts, and I saw that was a question earlier. So we will share that with everyone. Um, so you'll see how the forms are made. And in the training, actual training that we do, um, you will get into more detail on how to do it, how to create it, the step-by-step -step process. So with the mentee feedback, the goal is to get every mentee to complete it. You want 100% feedback from the mentees. So that's so with this data, you will use it um, to assist you in analyzing what you can improve in your next session, um, what was good about your session, what was bad about your session. Because remember, you might walk away, and I've done a few cohorts now, uh, you might walk away from a session and be like, oh my gosh, this was great, this was fantastic, I learned so much from it, I think the girls enjoyed it, only to find out that most of the girls didn't enjoy it, and this is the reason why. So when doing it and i'll show you in our graph later you will see um the the different types of uh questions we ask um and some of them is qualitative and quantitative so we give them a rating scale how would you rate the session from a one to five um if five means it was excellent and one means it was terrible and although you might have felt that your session was a five in reality it was actually a one um for them that's how about they feel and they will then you ask them why to get the why out of it and from that you will learn what you need to do in order to improve for the next session so that's what you want that's what the importance of the feedback form is and um i say aim for 100 percent with mentees but there is a reality that you won't get a 100 percent i would suggest 80 percent so okay 75 percent to 80 percent but Aim more for 80. So motivate the girls to respond. Get the mentors involved. Ask them to reach out to their girls in the circles. Um, hey, Diana, for example, uh, please make sure you've completed the feedback form. Um, and also make sure that you send it as soon as the session ends. Even as you're doing your um, exit comments, put in the chat pod, especially when you're online, uh, so that the girls can start filling it in. Or if you're doing an in-person sessions, uh, when we all manage to do that, hopefully soon, save 10, 15 minutes at the end and ask the girls to complete it right there and then. Because you, 
you start losing um you start losing mentees once you have given them you know if you don't give them the link immediately then they walk away forget to do it and try and get it done within 72 hours while the memory of the session is still really fresh in their minds so that's our mentee feedback we also want mentors feedback we want to hear what the mentors got out of it especially as a coordination team um they see mentors see it in a different from a different perspective as the mentees. So you also want to know what they got from it. What did they learn? What lessons did they learn out of it? How could we improve for them? Um, this one, I believe you can get 100% of the mentors to complete. Um, again, also just like the mentees, send it straight after the session. So as soon as the session ends, send it out um, and just get them to do it. Um, with the mentors, it will be slightly easier to follow up because there's not usually a hundred or, you know, a, a big number of mentors. So it's easier to follow up with them to get their information. Um, again, um, so when we do our breakout rooms, in my breakout room, I'm, doing, I'm going to go into the form so you can see how they look. Um, just because I'm time conscious, um, I'm not gonna go into them and show you how they look. So something that you can do in the mentors feedback form, um, besides the baseline questions, name, age, whatever, is to also add questions that you want. So I always add who wants to be a facilitator for the next sessions. So you spread out your work as well. It helps a lot to ask those questions in it. And then let me show you an example of, oh, sorry. Um, when you do your feedback forms on Google Forms, the nice thing about it is that it will give you a paragraph, uh, sorry, a pie chart, not a paragraph, a pie chart of the results. So um, this is one we did last year with the diaspora cohort and a session that we thought went well, and this is what I was saying, we thought it went really well. Only 70% of the girls gave us a rating of five. And the person that gave us a three, we read into why. And it was because she felt like she couldn't relate to the material. It wasn't done in a way that related to her. So that's why it's important to do this so that we knew in the next session how to present the words to the girls, make it easier. Um, just one last thing, um, a nice way to get, make sure to see which people have responded is to do the circle names and ask them to put in what circle they're part of. So you know who responded and who hasn't. Um, and also asking, then you can ask the mentors of each circle to follow up with their girls. That's also a really good way to do that. But I will talk about it more in depth when I get into the breakout room. So join room five. <laughs> okay, back to you, Diana. <laughs> funny, I saw that, I saw that. I'll be in room one. Anyway, ladies, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, where are we? Where are we in our, in our journey on collecting M and E? We're really at part two. Part one that Mary talked about was collecting the data as somebody joins BNI collecting that information and then using that information as we prepare for the cohorts, we prepare speakers and as we prepare to see when and how to run. And now Kini has been talking about the cohort is running and how do you make sure that you're actually getting information to guide you, to guide the process and to help you have conversations that add value to your mentors and your mentees. And again, the detail will be in the training we're inviting you to sign up for it at the end of this session. So I'm going to be talking about circles and I just want to share with you the genesis. So in Uganda, we have bigger groups. We've had groups of over 100 um, ladies mentored, but in each of those big groups, we have circles and um, our circles now, we're hoping that the maximum can be eight ladies with two mentors, but in some countries and also in Uganda, We've had women who come up intentionally and say, I want to run a small group. One woman ran a small group for her daughters and her house help. And Nabila, a sister from Kuwait, has run a small group of six ladies in Kuwait. Portugal has run a small group. And what we specifically developed is a tool that can help you, yes, with collecting information during the session, but also reporting on that circle. And how do we do this? Risa is going to share the tool. 
the tool has the generic information around how many people attended etc but most importantly it begins to ask for qualitative information it begins to ask for information around what challenges do you face as you run this uh, this cohort give three takeaways and every session that the that the a leader that the, of that group feeds into is practically a report. So it eases reporting. It's one report, it's consolidated, and it eases reporting for that lady who wants to start a small group with her daughters, or that lady who wants to start a small group with her nieces, with her friends, children, with her, with her own uh, peers in, 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 a, in, um, in her environment. And what we're we trying to say is that ladies, these tools are for you, they're for me. They're to ease our engagement as we build, you know, to the 1 million mentees by 2025. Thank you, Rita. And as I uh, hand over to Rita, now we've collected the data. We've collected the data from uh, registration. We've collected the data in the feedback uh, in the rooms as we do, the, <laughs> as we do the, the sessions. And now what happens with it? Do we just keep those reports in our computers and say we're doing great. Rita is going to answer that question. Thank you, Rita. Um, I, there, there are many times, you know, you leave a session and you're all feeling that nice warm glow and you're thinking, oh, the girls were on fire and everyone is patting themselves on the back. Um, but I always, I think for me, I'm always cautious and I say, what did the mentees feel? Did they feel the fire that we felt? And the only way you validate it is by looking at the data. So I, I, I won't lie to you. I, I'm one of those, the moment the data starts coming in, um, I start looking at it. And, and this, this, is what, this is what it looks like, guys. Mm? And, and I, I really hope I can entice you to look into it. So remember those questions Kinney was talking about in the feedback form. How would you rate the session? You really want to know on a scale of one to five, even after us, after here, after this session, we're going to be giving you a feedback form. And, and if Diana and I are feeling, oh, it was such a great session, but people are saying, no, it was a two and a one, it means that there's something that needs to be aligned. So here is a, an example of um, an extract of a report that came out. So this is a really good report, you know, a lot of fives and fours and things like that. Um, so it's important that you're able to pull that information out. And this is, this is where m &E starts getting live for you. This young lady, who, for instance, identi who, who rated the session three, we want to know why, what happened here? How come everyone else is rating it a five, but this person is rating it a four? And she gives some really good pointers. You know, she would like to see, receive some information, you know, in advance. She wants to see what's coming up ahead. So already we begin to see how we can improve um, the performance. But this is where your analysis starts. Remember I said, uh, when we collect feedback, when we collect and, and, and report under m and &E, it's not just about pushing numbers or pushing the report out. Try and make sense out of it. And for instance, when you look, um, when you look at this form, you begin to see certain things emerge. They, for instance, this is clearly a session one, yeah? You can see the mention of trust. You can see certain themes like um, confidentiality um, that are coming out. Um, it's about encouraging other women. And what we then do is that we take this information um, and we say, okay, like for instance, of the 20 girls that have responded, um, for example, 80% uh, of them mentioned, you know, the importance of having a village for, for argument's sake, if it was um, session two on, on courageous leadership, then you know the messages have sunk in. This one on uh, building trust. When you see the girls talk a lot about uh, making sure that when you establish relationships, it's about confidential, uh, uh, having uh, confidential relationships. Um, and um, for instance, um, the, the openness in terms of making sure that you're comfortable um, with other women and that prioritizing relationships with other women and building trusting relationships that that, that then you then you know that you've had an impact um, otherwise all we're doing is saying yes we had a session and yes 18 people came but the question is what was the impact of those um, 18 people some that, that, that we have, we have, um, we're going to be going through this entire process. Everything we've just done condensed. We shall be doing it over a two session uh, period. You can tell that it's, you know, we are really going through, you know, in a hurried manner. But for every step, we shall ask what tool is being used, who is going to be doing it, who is going to make sure that the data then gets pushed up to the next level. Who is it that then takes that data and consolidates it from the different circles, the different cohorts? 
past the country, who picks up the data from South Africa, Uganda, all the different places. So the entire value chain shall be um, shared with you. So that is just a snapshot and a taste um, of um, what, are we ready for the Mentimeter? The, of of, um, of, of um, what the process is. If you remember those indicators I, in, I, I showed you earlier on, how we recruit, the input indicators, how we then um, have um, processes, the running of the cohorts, and then how we graduate the girls. Um, and there will be a different room where we're going to talk about the process evaluation. Um, we had a little a, a, like a little game that we wanted to play with you just to illustrate the difference between the quantitative and the qualitative data. Um, it was supposed to come in the middle of uh, my other session and we just decided, no, we're gonna do it a little bit before we go into the breakout rooms. So here goes, um, first question. So get ready to participate, please. Yeah, sorry. You have to turn on your Mentimeter. So go back. For those of you who had um, signed on, um, on the Mentimeter, please go back. I think Keza is going to, to put in the chat um, the Mentimeter. Or Diana, you can help repost the Mentimeter um, link for those who are not able to join us. OK. So are we there? I'm just posting the slide so that people can also use the QR code. Yeah, they can use the phone. So um, turn on your phone and get the camera going um, so that you can get the QR code. And once you get the QR code, it should show up on your phone and you're good to go with the Mentimeter. If not, in the chat box, Keza has posted um, the link. You can click on it and it will take you there. Okay, so Diana, you can drop that slide and then we watch uh, what is going to happen with Keza. Keza, the first question is? Okay, so this is a game. I want you to think about the last circle that you graduated. How many mentees graduated from that circle? So think about your last circle. How many mentees graduated from that circle? So we have capped it at eight because typically we say a circle should not go beyond eight, right? Right, okay, okay. Graduated, guys, no cheating here. Graduated, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We can see, so the average is about 5.5, yeah? That graduated. So let me ask you this, is that a good performance? If we imagine that the performance is 5.5, is that a good performance? Please put your responses in the chat box. Graduating five, five mentees, is that a good performance? I'm watching the chat box. Is graduating five mentees? Depends, Aisha. Aha, uh -huh. someone says, okay, you keep on saying depends. Mm -hmm. It means we lose about three mentees each time. Guys, I'm asking a simple question. Is that a good performance? Alan says average, Steffi says no. But let me ask you this. How, how do you know that this is a good performance or a bad performance? And I think that's why earlier on, someone said it depends. I think it was Izana that said it depends. So what is the point? Point one, having numbers that are not in context do not help you. So question number two, Keza, let's get question number two up. Those, that average of 5.5 mentees that graduated, what was the total number that were in that circle? What was the total number of mentees that were in that circle? In other words, now you're counting those that did not. Okay, so it's 6.4, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, 6.5, mm-hmm, okay. So it's still a pretty good performance eh? because if it's 5.5 out of 6 point, an average of 6.5, we're probably looking in the 80, 90 percentage range. Yeah, okay, okay. So you see why it's important to know out of. So let's do that math. All of you calculate, what was it? So for example, in my circle, if there were six girls that graduated out of eight, that is about a 75% performance, yeah? So next question, Keza, could you please post what your percentage score was, your percentage graduation rate. So it's between zero and 100%. Okay, so whoever those first three people are, they're saying they have a 100% graduation rate and kudos to you. 
because I'm still yet to be in one that has a 100% graduation rate. So you can see the number. There's a tug of war happening there, 81%. I think this is the reality kicking in. Yes, 76%, 73%. Let's keep those numbers coming in. Your graduation rate, the percentage of girls that graduated, 72%. You can see how the number is adjusting now. Huh? I think the reality is kicking in. And it's okay. It's okay that sometimes you even have a 50% graduation rate, as long as you go back and you ask yourself what happened there, 70% graduation rate. Okay. So this is the point. The point is that it's important for you to not just report numbers, huh? five girls graduated, uh, 10 girls graduated, out of what? When you're providing your reports, and that's why you might think these people are asking for a lot of information, but Every piece of information we are asking for in the tools that we have developed, it's because there's a reason. The reason we are asking you to say, how many graduated out of how many that started the circle? Or how many mentors were trained out of how many signed up? It's important because it gives you context. If you're signing up 500 mentors and only 200 are being, uh, are, are being trained, there's a problem over there. So percentages are very important. It is important not only for you to contextualize, it's also important for you to compare. It means that, for instance, you can compare with another circle, you can compare your performance with another cohort. We can compare performance with Uganda. If Uganda's graduation rate, for example, is 95%, and then in South Africa, our graduation rate is 55%, there's something that's not happening right in South Africa, which means we must then ask the why, the qualitative information. And that's the example we're going to go into next. So Keza, okay? So that's the, the first set of, of discussions we have had relate to numbers. But like we're saying, m is fun because you also get a bit of qualitative information. So for example, let me ask you guys, what is your favorite G4G? G? <laughs> I know, it's always courageous leadership. What is your favorite G4G G module? Come on, let's, I know, I know it has to be. Okay, even in the test run, courageous leadership was right up there. Okay, a bit of balance. Yes, communication, negotiations. Woo, negotiations is going up, up. There's a competition here between courageous leadership and negotiations. Ethics, ethics, is the, oh, art of communications is back up. Right, right. Okay, let's get a few more votes in. So negotiations is now the winner. Okay, okay. So clearly negotiations and courageous leadership are quite popular, yeah? I'm actually surprised because every time we did the test run, it was more courageous uh, leadership. So we, yeah, so we're clearly at uh, negotiations, number one, and then courageous leadership, um, number two. But let me ask you this next question, why? We want to know what is it that you liked about negotiations that made it the most popular or courageous leadership that made it the, um, the next most popular? In, in three words, we, we have to be brief, yeah? Three things that you liked about negotiations, those of you who voted for negotiations, three things, those of you who voted for courageous leadership. What did you like about those sessions? Okay, challenging, vulnerability, it's meaningful, it's reflective. Come guys. Bargaining, yes. I like that, that's, so that's clearly a negotiations person. Openness, practice, practice. So the role play is actually, I thought out of communication might be number two. It's so interesting that, yeah, okay, so the practical. So the bigger words, remember in this Mentimeter game, the bigger words are the words that resonate more um, with people. So the reflective is clearly a trait that people like in the modules that are popular. But when it's challenging, when it's practical, I think practical and practice are probably the same things coming together. And that probably references the role play yeah, that we do in, in, in the sessions. Um, it is empowering. Um, so yeah. These are the reasons, these are the whys. And that is why if you look at the feedback form that uh, Kinelwe talked about, we don't just ask rate this session. Was it a one, on a one to five? We also ask, what did you like? And when they do that, they're doing what you're doing. 
And what you're doing right now and what this tool is helping us do is that it's picking up the most popular words and it's helping us with the analysis. So once again, there are certain dominant words that are coming out. I could, for instance, argue that of the 32 respondents right now, maybe about 10% have talked about um, the sessions, the popular sessions being reflective, being practical, being empowering. Do you see how the why starts to come out of your feedback? Last, last um, I think there's a last question, yeah? Okay, okay. So we are hoping that this is um, showing you how m and &E can, can be a little bit more interesting. So, and, and again, we're showing you different forms of analysis. All of this is available. If you ask the young mentees, what we do, um, as I'm talking, I'm actually talking to my daughter over here. She's the one who is really good with the analysis. It's ca you're capable of doing this. It's possible for Namuchana in Zambia um, or Lillian in Botswana to say, hey guys, who is good at analysis and let's see how this data goes. So last question before we go for the break. What traits do you most commonly see in mentees after they graduate? And this is an evaluation question. Think about it. Do you see confidence? Do you see tolerance and open-mindedness? There was one cohort we had where it was even about sexual orientation. Do you see the girls as being value-driven? Do you see that kinship developing from building trust? Do you see public speaking skills, for example, from art of communication? So here you actually have to vote for each of these traits. If you don't see any of these traits, you put a zero. If you see the trait to the full, you vote for the extreme, yeah? Confidence. So confidence is a big one. Huh? And if you think about the evaluation questions that we ask about the effectiveness, confidence is a big thing that we look for. Because when we talk about empowering um, um, young girls to lead, you definitely need um, confidence. So it's interesting that we actually have a very good balance um, across. Uh, but clearly, um, confidence is the most popular at 4.4, um, followed by tolerance. OK, it's spreading out actually public speaking and then uh, kinship with other women. So clearly it means we are seeing effectiveness of the G4G program. And here we can clap for ourselves in terms of building trust because kinship with other women is about building trust. We can talk about the fact that we are being effective with courageous leadership because confidence is a clear, um, um, a clear outcome of, um, um, of courageous leadership. We can talk about the effectiveness of the art of communication because public speaking skills is, is one of the skills that comes out of that session, etc, etc, etc. So right now here in this room, the 115 people, or at least the 41 that have voted on our behalf, have actually given a thumbs up and validated that G4G is indeed effective. So I'm gonna stop here. And I'm hoping that this inspires you to collect data and to use your data and, and, and turn it into something fun. Uh, but as you turn it into something fun, let's also use it to motivate us so that we can deliver better programs um, for G4G. Okay, handing it over to Diana. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you so much, ladies, for staying on. We are having so much fun that we have run out of the time. We have a break. And when we come back, we're going to go into the breakout rooms where we're going to be looking and having conversations around more specific aspects and um, portions of the M&E or rather the monitoring and evaluation that we're going to be covering. But I understand that some of you might not be able to come, up, come back because you had allocated the time for this particular time. So if you are not going to be able to come back and join us, my humble request is for you to kindly, kindly um, during the break, stay on, ask a question, but most importantly, for you to fill the feedback form, which Joanne is going to post in the chat function now. If you're going to come back and stay with us throughout the breakout rooms, we're asking, kindly asking you for an additional 30 minutes of your Sunday afternoon. And uh, we would love to have you stay on. If you can't stay on, please, please fill out the feedback form. It will go a long way in helping us um, prepare and plan for the next uh, sessions that we engage with. So Kini, you can play the music. If you have a question, post it. Yes, Rita. Yes, so um, for the ones who are staying and want to go to the breakout rooms, um, yes. for us to know which rooms to send you to, we're yeah, referencing yeah. the Google form. 
but we need some people to put their surnames so that we know uh, which rooms to allocate you to. So please edit your name so that it's both your first as well as um, your surname and we know which rooms to allocate you to. Thank you. Okay. Can, can they see my screen? Can they see my, no, they can't, my participants list, no. Yeah, we can, we can see it. We can see the, can see. the agenda and at the bottom are the breakout rooms, yeah. Okay, cool. So what Rita is asking is that if you filled out the Google form, you're going to be assigned to the breakout room you want to go to. However, we need for you to put your full name. So if you have memory, you can put your full name there. We have Mariama, put your full name Maria so that they can allocate you to the right room. And right now, Kini is going to play some music. If you can kindly fill the feedback form if you're not coming back. And if you're coming back, I promise it's just going to be another 30 minutes and then we'll be done. But 30 minutes of fun, 30 minutes of learning and 30 minutes of engagement.